In our first episode, we boldly declared that we were that most dreaded variety of Christian citizen in the kingdom of heaven, Calvinists. And yet, this system of doctrine is not a newcomer to the faith, and its adherents are not ignoble lightweights in the annals of history. John Calvin's work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, has been paramount in giving biblical understanding to heavyweight defenders of the faith ever since its publication. Not only did it encourage the faithful of the day, who were experiencing tremendous persecution and martyrdoms at the hand of the Roman Catholic See, but it was also embraced later by giants of Christianity such as the Puritans, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, John Newton. William Wilberforce, A. A. Hodge, Louis Burkhoff, J. Gresham Macon, Gary North, James White, B. B. Warfield, Jeff Durbin, R. L. Dabney, Douglas Wilson, R. C. Sproul, and many, many others. Many others. <laughs> However, it is no secret that many self-ascribed Calvinists have only ascribed to the gospel as presented by Calvinists and enjoy the teachings of Christian leaders who are Calvinists, but they themselves have never dared to open the weighty tome itself, which has given rise to many great reformations and revivals, strengthened and emboldened preachers and parishioners, and aided in the rehabilitation or founding of governments and kingdoms. As a result, we are going to begin a systematic review of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, taking our time in each episode to dive into the rich doctrines of the Christian faith set down by Calvin, which he derived from much study of our ultimate authority on the things of God, the Bible. We begin today with John Calvin's preface to the Institutes, which gives his reasoning for undertaking this massive endeavor in the first place. Those reasonings are just as practical now in the world of comment section debates as they were in Calvin's day, where defending the faith could mean your life or your livelihood. Our hope is that studying this preface will be a great encouragement to you, giving you assurance of the biblical soundness of your beliefs and boldness to speak the truth when the situation calls for your voice to be heard, so that in the final analysis, you can know your doctrines and know your grades. Good evening, Seth. Good evening, Cole. I have been waiting for this one for a long time because this episode is, it's really the whole reason why we're doing this. Yeah, basically. Uh, but also so I could quote some old Irish folk songs for you. Oh, is that so, what the what you have in store that's for what, me? <laughs> I've been waiting for this for so long. <laughs> so here you go. This is from the old Irish pub song, uh, Humors of Whiskey, because as you can see, First whiskey for the show. Yes. This is and pretty big stuff. We're only in episode three, and we've yeah. already yeah. said. <laughs> it's going <All> right. downhill. <laughs> we're reacting at this point. But it says this. So, so stick to the crater, which is the Gaelic and Irish word for whiskey, the best thing in nature for sinking your sorrows and raising your joys. For there's nothing like whiskey to make maidens frisky. It soon separates all the men from the boys. <laughs> We'll find out on this episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but We're going to separate the men from the boys yeah. as soon as we start opening these books. Well, the word crater, as well as other Irish and Gaelic words for whiskey, actually means uh, water of life. Mm -hmm. So it, we'll find out these things will give us life or make us feel like we're dying. So so, I'm, so that's actually fun to know because like in old movies, when we watch it, like uh, – like, uh, oh, I forget, going my way. Like a Bing Crosby movie where he's like some Catholic priest. He's like, <laughs> uh, you know, the old priest, he's like getting in bed and, and uh, he's like, oh, wouldn't you have a, a wee nip of the creature? And, oh, and I was uh, always like, I, I have no, I'm sure that's an Irish thing, you're doing which that, it is. You're doing that thing again where our age, the age gap between us is showing. Yeah. There was a no time idea. where movies didn't have color. <laughs> there was um, a <laughs> <laughs> you know, they only came out of one one speaker was only oh, necessary for conveying the, all the sound effects and that dialogue. That was like and, Blockbuster, right? Um, yeah. Back in the day? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. They, they did have black and white movies. Mm. Yes. Well, there you go. Hey, what are our grains today? All right. So, so our, our grains, grains today, uh, since we're keeping it local uh, and we're recording in Virginia, uh, our grains for today, it's one of my favorite whiskeys, is the Bowman Brothers uh, Small Batch. And um, so it is, it's from Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, that's where the, uh, the distillery is. Uh, and it's the A. Smith Bowman Distillery. So this is the Virginia Straight Bourbon Whiskey. 
and it's got the pioneer spirit. Um, this thing will, I mean, Oh, it was good. Hey, I was worried. I was like, we're at, we might have a couple takes here. But <laughs> <laughs> no some strength. All right. So, uh, let me pour it. And then as, as we're pouring it, we'll discuss more on yeah. this, uh, this local distillery. So say when, Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was a long day. All right. That's good. All right. Now, <laughs> did you want, did you want the rocks in? Oh yeah, we had, all right, let's talk about this. Okay. So, so Seth before the show was like, Hey, do we want to start with rocks already in the glass? And I thought, no, yeah, that's, th- only- it wasn't a question <laughs> because I'm <It> was- a man. <laughs> I was like, oh, we'll start goodness. without the rocks and then you know, yeah. we'll put them in there. Well, and you folks who listened to the other episode and heard me go on a little conversation about shower beers, I was like, I might drink shower beers, but I, at least I have standards. <laughs> I want rocks in here, but we don't have them. So here we go. To the king. To the king. Hmm. <laughs> You know, we do that often yeah. on the show. Ooh, my eyes are watering a little bit. Mm. Oh, my word. That is so yeah. good. It's like kissing a rattlesnake. I like it. <laughs> it's good. Ooh. I'm like, oh, that was so smooth yeah. and so smoky, but but like not not super, super smoky. It's just mm. like got the like really nice. Oh, yeah. I'm sweating now. I tell you <laughs> yeah, what. I yeah. Cause I, so I'm not going to lie. You guys might have picked up on it. We're a little sleepy, but that just, <laughs> goodness, I can run through a brick wall. No, now. I felt like, huh, well. The day is over. Let's, you know, talk about some theology. So. Yeah, no, this this is one of those things. You ever like, uh, this is kind of gross, but you ever had like a wart frozen off? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, no, so I haven't. So when they do that. When Please, they, go on with your wait, story. Wait, wait, wait. So when they do that, they get like a really, 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 really cold like tool or whatever, and mm-hmm. they basically freeze it off. But it's so cold that it's hot. Yeah. All right. That's how this pole was. Like it was very icy and smooth. And then out of nowhere, Dante's Inferno. Like I'm I'm sweating. <laughs> And um, I'm still like my chest is like mm, another, <laughs> please. See, <laughs> see, I I I drank. It. I was like, oh, that didn't kick as bad as I thought it would. Mm. And um, so I've had this. No, b- no, I, I yeah, you're right. I've yeah. had this before, and a lot of times, um, the first one will, will like really kick you, but like the next day, like something <laughs> something about the next day when you have a glass after you open it, it's just. It's like the, it aerated enough that there's just so much more flavor and and, bu- gotta and keep bouquet. Nursing, yeah, you got to keep nursing the bottle till the next day is what you're telling uh-huh. me. Gracious. Well, I will say, let's go ahead before we talk more about this uh, this local group. Did you want your eyes? Oh, did you actually bring those? Yeah, in? I brought oh, ice. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead and put, drop them bad boys in here. I was going to say. So uh, these are, uh, oh, they got warm. Oh, well, that's a shame. No, they look, wow, would you look at that? You want to hold that up to the folks? I'm, oh, I'm yeah. impressed. So, oh, this looks like drugs. I mean, they're <laughs> like old playing dice. I don't know. Uh, these are these are just stones, like wow. stones that you put in your freezer. I mean, that's they're, wild. They're still cold a little wow. bit. Maybe, maybe that's how uncultured I am. I was about to say because, like, as far as whiskeys and hard liquors go, um, I grew up in North Louisiana where we had like F one fifty Mardi Gras. <laughs> so, like, I'm used to like you know Crown Royal and some maybe some Jack Daniels, but I will say this takes the crown over your normal store-bought stuff. Oh, yeah. Because this, yeah, yeah. like, this this is, uh, no no kidding, art for your taste buds and uh, nothing but fiery gospel for your, your soul. Because yeah. I'm still like, whoa. But uh, let me give it another step. Tell us a little bit more about this local All right, group. so um, they have a little bit on the back of the bottle um, that tells – uh, about the history of this whiskey. I'm going to read. Obviously, I have something in my hand. I'm going to read. Um, so it says, uh, John Jay, Abraham, Joseph, and Isaac Bowman were Virginia militia officers in the American Revolutionary War. That's right. Tough. This handcrafted bourbon whiskey is a tribute to their heroism. Our Bowman Brothers small batch whiskey, uh, uh, small batch bourbon is distilled three times using the finest corn, rye, and malted barley, producing distinct distinct hints of vanilla, spice, and oak. The blessed trinity. Mm. So that's actually, uh, you know, from the bottle. They also have that description on their website as well, um, which is asmithbowman.com. If you want to go and you can buy this on online, I'm pretty sure, asmithbowman.com, or you find where. Um, I and then gonna, I was going to say, this is one, because we, we've talked about before, we want to give you guys like a scale of one to 10, and then like, would this like be worth ordering from wherever you're at across the country, around the world? This is, I mean, gracious, 
Mm-hmm. I feel like I just sat through like some good Reformed Baptist <laughs> preaching on that. Hey, that's the compliment for the Baptist. <laughs> it's about there time. There you go. There it and is. it had to do there with alcohol. Go. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Well, well Reformed Baptists, I mean, yeah. They're, oh, okay. They're, yeah, more. they're like, ah, uh, yes. But scale of one to 10 before we keep reading about them. I mean, honestly, it's like a nine. I uh, Yeah, that might be among the best bourbons I've, I've ever yeah. had. So, yeah. yeah. And, um, dude, I mean, it's hard because you're just like, yeah, it's episode three and we have a 10. <laughs> well, but, but <laughs> close. Yeah, I'd say I'd say a nine, but I will but say th- too. But this is an award-winning whiskey yes. as well. I mean, part of selling a product too is you know giving off a biblical masculine aesthetic, and you can't see it probably from y'all's end, but like the silhouette of the brothers is in the background, and it looks tough. Like it looks like Mel Gibson and the Patriot to go rough <laughs> up the red coats. So, so they actually have a little bit more about the history of of like the distillery itself on their website. And it says in 1927, before establishing Virginia's oldest distillery, I mean, it's Virginia's oldest distillery, A. Smith Bowman purchased the 7,200-acre Sunset Hills Farm in Fairfax County with one objective, to open up a dairy and granary. Shortly after bringing the idea to life, his fields became so abundant that he needed to, a use for the excess grain. Mm. This one defining moment changed the entire course of the A. Smith Bowman legacy and ultimately led to the best whiskey in the world. Mm. In 1934, A. Smith Bowman built a groundbreaking distillery on the farmland and turned it into a family-owned business. With the help of his two sons, he produced the first ever batch of Virginia Gentlemen. Up Hmm. until the 1950s, A. Smith Bowman Distillery was the sole producer of legal whiskey in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Lord bless the Commonwealth. Since then, the focus has shifted from our classic spirit to producing premium handcrafted small batches and experimental additions that embody innovation at its core. Today, our historic family-owned distillery has relocated to Fredericksburg, yet still continues to balance our long-lived traditions, honoring one of Virginia's great pioneers. Most recently in 2016 and 2017, A. Smith Bowman Distillery won the world's best bourbon at the World Whiskies Award, solidifying us as Virginia's most award-winning distillery. So I have absolutely no problem saying it's a 10. All Just right, because you can everybody go else that, said we go with that. I'll go with I'll hold I'll go a nine with the, the because pressure. I don't have any I don't have any like show you know <laughs> comparable notes here. Like we haven't done another whiskey yet. But what I will say, are you gonna, a big whiskey drinker? Um, probably based off the like amount of sweat <laughs> on my forehead right now, I'd probably not as much as I ought I ought to be. But the show <laughs> will change that I'm mm-hmm. sure. And as you know, as much as we keep reading through the institutes, that will change. But what I will say is, my in laws live in Fredericksburg, and this might not be the most Christian thing to say. But now that I know there's places in Fredericksburg, I'll have to grab a handful every time I go see them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I could probably stand to get a little bit more you know experience under my wings with regard to whiskeys. But I will. I wouldn't be upset with a 10 either. So either way, you folks got to check them out. Right. Uh, this, yeah, this, I'm very excited to continue drinking this throughout the course this of the show. This one final detail, it's a 90 proof and a 45% alcohol. Yeah. In case you're just curious, you're like, what is the proof? You could, you yeah. could kill germs on your hands with this. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely but, COVID. We didn't have a literal chaser, but what we want to start doing in the show is have a segment of a chaser conversation before moving on to the heavyweight yeah. conversation of the institutes. Yeah. So, Seth, what is today's chaser? Today's conversation? chaser conversation is historic localism. Mm. So, Cole, can you please explain what historic localism is? And oh, gasp! Did the uh, the drink that we just drank have any sort of mm. you know, exemplification? Yeah, did it did it demonstrate what historic mm-hmm. localism yeah, is? Demonstrate what? is a good word. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Exempl. If we just thinkify through this yeah. right now, brainificate the situation. The transmogrifier. I'll start turning into W. Bush. Well, <laughs> here here's the thing, Seth. So we've talked before about localism on the show, Christian localism in particular, the idea that the covenantal Christian community uh, at the base unit of the family is what governs and maintains societies, family, church, and state. But in community, uh, working together, living together in all aspects of life. So then what is historic localism? Historical localism is when that culture is so ingratiated into, no kidding, the social DNA of a region that it, it holds there over time. And so what's so beautiful about this particular product and what they're doing over there at the Bowman Boys, I'll call them, is <laughs> they're continuing a legacy that that the fruit lives on. Now, perhaps the social fruit of that, of what 
what this kind of drink used to bring people together for has certainly changed and has certainly been abused through the decades. But nonetheless, we ought to aim to be the kind of Christians where the fruit of our hands echoes into the following generations. That's what we need to aim for together collectively, because while this is named after one family, I promise you it took a village to put together this product and maintain it and promote it and make it such a popular whiskey. So that's the initial, you know, what is historic localism, if you want to add anything to that. No, uh, if you're going to buy 7,200 acres, (laughs) you know, you you have a purpose for it. And that purpose isn't like, oh, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to do this and maybe something will turn out and who knows? Yeah. Like you have generations in mind. Yes. And and so like it even said, like with his sons, mm-hmm. and you know, obviously that name has continued, mm-hmm. the Bowman name, even down to like now we're talking about it. Like in 1927, he wasn't worried about whether or not, you know, a bunch of whippersnappers from, you know. <laughs> in the year 2023. Yeah, in the 2000s. On their iPhones. Yeah, and, almost 100 yeah. years later. Yeah, pretty crazy. Um, will they be drinking this? No, he, he just wanted to start a, a granary and yeah. – um, Done. So, and just took the opportunity as it was. Yeah. So, so part of it is because is because we could point to a number of, and we're going to throughout the course of the show, point mm-hmm. to these kind of pioneers of industry who put God first and all that they did and said, Lord, take this offering and do with it what you will. We're going to talk about plenty of those folks. But you don't might be, actually know if they're Christian or not. So if you're yes. <laughs> if you're the Bowman family and you're watching this and you're like, hey, we're totally Christian, then like, great. That would, that's a plus. Let us know. That's a plus. But what I will say is- If even, not, you yeah, need to repent and follow Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there it is. But even if they're not, here's what I will say, is that kind of vision um, and commitment is built upon a Christian worldview, mm-hmm. even if it's in spite of it. And so, you know, you might be little old me thinking, well, I'm not- the Bowman brothers. I'm not, you know, the Guinness family, whatever. Uh, you, you might not be, your children might not be, but your children's children and their children may be. And so the question is, how are you even thinking about discipling them right. with the gospel that transforms societies? And that's the task that everyone has of, you need to grow where you're planted and steward to the people you're accountable to. Right. And, and the first thing you need to do is stop thinking about 7,200 acres right now. <laughs> there's no way you you can afford that right now. If you can, but, send us some more whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, just be asking the Lord and be thinking, like, what... What sort of resources can I tap into right now? Like, I mean, that may be crypto. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know, I know guys who who've done that very well, um, and it, it may be, it may just be starting a mechanics business or brewing mead in your your garage or whatever it might be. Or you know, so um, don't despair, don't give up hope. And I'm not just going to say like you know just. Go for your dreams, because that's that's like very whatever. Oh man, it's almost like you're working on a post for that right now <laughs> for the post malicious campaign this month. Um, here's the last thing I'll say for the chaser conversation before we move on to today's doctrines mm-hmm. is um, part of the reason why our culture has struggled with this uh, is one, we're hyper individual, yeah. but then two, with regard to where people want to settle down, where they want to go across the country to ultimately live, is so based on what can this community do for me as opposed to what can my family do for this community? And that has to start with the people of God uh, towards one another and the household of God and then to communities at large saying, no, we are committed to root here that Lord willing, our name will live on in this city, in this town, in this county for generations to come. But that's so foreign to our country as well because we're so young in the grand scheme of things. But Mm -hmm. Lord willing, we can change that. Yeah. So it takes like short-term thinking and long-term thinking. Mm-hmm. It's like, I mean, you're doing things in the short term short, short term for a purpose, but you also have, you know, the long term as well. I mean, it's kind of like a football game. I mean, you got to get the first down. Yeah. You're not always shooting for the end zone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, some, but, there are some people, Hail Mary every time, it'll work. But <laughs> you and I are not those people. No. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started on football or, yeah. You know, you've already brought up like George W. Bush. I want to go down conspiracy theory rabbit holes. and We're not going to do that. But let's, let's uh, get some more whiskey first. Let's talk about, um, you know, being rooted and grounded and growing where you need to, mm-hmm. to be by getting into our doctrines for today. Mm-hmm. And so this is an undertaking that is quite daunting, to be honest. It really Because, is. I mean, look at this. And if you are married and you have kids and you look at this, you may think, yeah. oh, I'm going to listen to this on an audiobook at three times the speed. And then I'll say, oh, I listened through the, the institutes. And then you'll do it like two more times. And you'll say, oh, yeah, I listened to it like twice. And so... 
So what did you do? Um, but no, we were actually going through. <laughs> that sounded very personal. Like, you, like one of us is looking. I don't know. That. I yeah. just, I just have this thing about people who listen to books like on three times speed and say, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I read two hundred books this past year. No, oh, you didn't. <laughs> You're not data from Star Trek. Well, so I mean, just again to, to stress your point. I mean, you could commit felonies with this book. <laughs> look how look how big. Like this is this it's a is door a stopper. Block. And yet. This is, this book, not, I mean, this is like a, a recent publication, but the writings that are found in this book have been foundational for yep. Christian understanding mm-hmm. for centuries now. Western civilization. And yeah. yeah, Western civilization owes like a ton to Calvin's Institutes. And not only that, it also addresses a lot of, um, a lot of the arguments that, Roman Catholics have against Reformation thinking. Yeah. And he does that in the preface. And so as we as we open up this book, I mean, there are four words and and four words to four words and, and yes. all that. And like notes <laughs> from the editor. A table but, of contents for the table of contents. Yeah. yeah. But we get to the um we get to the actual preface for the first edition. So uh he he actually published this, I think, three or four times. Yep. Um, yep. Worked on it at first, then you know published it again, then published it again, and published it again. So it it's became like, a life work. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so the first time that he published it, it was in um, oh my goodness, it's like right here, fifteen thirty six. Fifteen thirty six. Thank yep. you. <laughs> and when he he published it, he sent it. So he's in exile in yep. in uh, Switzerland. Yep. Uh, and I think he wrote this from Basel, actually. Mm-hmm. Yep. And. Uh, so he he sent this to the king of France at the time, which Francis was the first. Francis I in 1536. And the reason, do you know why he sent it to no, them? No, I do not say. No, you don't? No, please, no. share it with the class. Okay, so uh, most of the monarchies at that time were Roman Catholic. <gasps> and so this Reformation thought that was started by Martin Luther was was seen as or was a blight that needed to be stamped out. And so you have these people who are holding to this doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone, and um, and that is that is odious to the, to Roman Catholic thinking. So they undergo a tremendous amount of persecution, and it is sanctioned yep. by the royal government at that time, the monarchies. So in in response to this. Calvin, he writes down this, this systematic institute. theology. It's a systematic yeah. theology, and he writes it down to comfort the people who, who are adhering In to exile, this, yeah. this new doctrine. Um, but then he sends one to his home country of France, to the king himself, and that's where this preface comes in. So that's where we're going to start. Yeah, it's it's, and I'll give you guys a warning right off the bat. Like, aside from everything that Seth just addressed with how it's going to defend Protestantism, Protestantism in its infancy, um, and respond to Catholic uh, objections, one of the things that's so foundational, particularly for us living in post-modernity, is he is appealing to this sovereign, this king, because he has an understanding that the civil magistrate is a deacon of God. So, so. Yeah. Pay attention to that language as well. I was going to say, like, just a quote right off the bat. It, he appeals to King and he says, Justice then, most invincible sovereign, entitles me to demand you that you will undertake a thorough investigation of this cause, which has hitherto been tossed about in any kind of way and handled in the most irregular manner without any order of law and with passionate heat rather than judicial gravity. I mean, he is very humble throughout oh, this yeah. entire thing. Yeah. But the fact that he was like, no, 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 no. Like, you have an obligation before God to consider these things. Whoa. I yeah. Like, we think we're tough because we put comments on, like you were saying in the intro. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, man. And But that's, that's the thing that stuck out to me is that even though this man is, even though this king is allowing the persecution of John Calvin's brethren in his hometown, in his homeland, um, he still goes to great pains to address him in the most, um, you know, illustrious way. I mean, he starts off to his most, to his most Christian Majesty, the most mighty and illustrious monarch, Francis, King of the French, his sovereign, John Calvin prays peace and salvation in Christ. And so, um, he starts off. He's he's not. He's not like, yo, jerk. Yeah, <laughs> he could have. I mean, it was more of Luther's take, honestly, most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's, he's not out there going, let's go, Brandon. 
either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, all right, all right. Whoa, all right. Now I'm sweating again. It's not risky. Sheesh. No, but he understands he understands that uh, this ruler was put in place, but he also understands that it's his place as a minister of the gospel to remind the the king of his place. Yep. As a yeah. minister. Yeah. Um, I was going to read a certain it, capacity. Go another uh, section before we get, because ultimately where this goes structurally is he's basically saying, you know, Lord King, uh, thank you so much for being, uh, a, you know, a just ruler, a wise ruler. And because I know you're a wise ruler, you're going to, you know, investigate this. In fact, you have an obligation to. Here's some parameters you need to keep in mind. And here's seven things you need to know about why the Roman Catholic charges are not as accurate as you think. Thank you for your time. Please review this, right? Uh That's basically the structure in layman's terms. But I love, like, this is so powerful. I was going to read this first section if you wanted to read the second one where he's talking about, like, what is the role of the civil magistrate in relation to the church and monitoring um, the church's affairs and struggles and yet not doing the job of the church, right? So he says this, he says, your duty, most serene prince, is not to shut either your ears or mind against a cause involving such mighty interests as these, how the glory of God is to be maintained on the earth inviolate, or inviolate, how the truth of God is to preserve its dignity, how the kingdom of Christ is to continue um, among us compact and secure. The cause is worthy of your ear, worthy of your investigation, worthy of your throne. I mean, uh, Stephen Wolf just recently (laughs) wrote the case for Christian nationalism, and he cites this in chapter seven uh, titled The Christian Prince, where he's talking about, again, like the duty of any civil magistrate in a a Christian nation or any nation, because all nations belong to Christ, but we can do another episode on that later, is that they need to be aware of how the glory of God is being maintained in their civilization, how the truth of God is being preserved in its dignity, and how the kingdom of Christ is continuing and flourishing. That's, right. I mean, those are like three great places to start. And we could unpack that for ages yes. if we wanted to. And then like right after that, this is the one that I wanted to read, yep. was, is, <laughs> is where he reminds the king of, uh, of his obligation. And he says, the characteristic of a true sovereign is to acknowledge that in the administration of his kingdom, he is a minister of God. He who does not make his reign subservient to the divine glory acts the part not of a king, but a robber. I want you to let that sink in. That that hasn't changed from Calvin's day to ours. Yep. It is, it, it's still applicable to the United States of America yep. right now. Yep. And so we have a right and obligation to demand that our rulers be subservient to the almighty God. Yep. That's a whole different topic. More but, episodes. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ding, ding, ding. But anyway, like, I think the point is these, these people had such a robust view of government more than just like, you know, more than, than you're we taught in public school. every yeah. four years, yeah. brother? It's, yeah. it's way bigger than that. And it's way bigger than, well, Romans 13 just says. Yeah. You know, it says so, he's a minister of God. He's <laughs> yeah. the diaconos. He's the deacon, a deacon of God. So um, if you, anyway, no, I'm, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> he, moreover, deceives himself who anticipates long prosperity to any kingdom which is not ruled by the scepter of God. That is by his divine word. We're about 250 years into America and we've, you know, abandoned the divine word of God. Absolutely. We still have in God, we trust in the money though, but anyway. Right. For the heavenly oracle is infallible, which has declared that where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Mm -hmm. So um, he goes on in this preface uh, and, and his basic premise is, here are all the injustices and accusations yep. that are being lobbied against us. Before you, I just have to interrupt because like in the same way you're passionate about that section, because it is, it's a mighty section. Go look it up. Get you a copy, actually. That would be that would be better. <laughs> yeah. you know. And follow along. Yeah, follow along, actually. Uh, but this one I can't pass on either just because, again, it, it shows the totality of Calvin's thought because, um, we, you know, we're going to be systematically breaking this down section by section, piece by piece, but don't miss the 30,000-foot view that Calvin is giving the church a robust understanding of how the word saturates everything, not just the church, not just Christians, but all of society. He says this, but our doctrine must stand sublime above all the glory of the world and invincible by all its power because it is not ours, 
but that of the living God and his anointed Christ, whom the father has appointed king that he may rule from sea to sea, from the rivers, even to the ends of the earth. And so rule as to smite the whole earth and its strength of iron and brass, its splendor, gold and silver. And he goes on and on and on. And he's quoting Daniel chapter two, Isaiah 11 and Psalm two. But the point is, is like Christ is king that changes everything. Yeah. So just, I know we're going to keep saying that over and over, but let that sink in. And uh, but that's where he's starting from. Yeah, absolutely. As he's going into As this. we all should. And, uh, and so that informs his actions as he's writing this. And, uh, that, in, that, in, that informed the, the, the thought to send this to the King. Um, I mean, he could have just sent it to Christians, but he sent it also yep. to the King yep. because he wanted to defend, uh, defend the faith. That's what he wanted to do. Yep. And he says, um, Look now to our adversaries, I mean the priesthood, and he's talking about the Roman Catholic priesthood, at whose beck and pleasure others ply their enmity against us. And consider with me for a little by what zeal they are actuated. The true religion which is delivered in the scriptures and which all ought to hold, they readily permit both themselves and others to be ignorant of, yep. to neglect and despise, and catch this, and they deem it of little moment what each man believes concerning God and Christ or disbelieves, provided he submits to the judgment of the church with what they call implicit faith. Nor are they greatly concerned, though they should see the glory of God dishonored by open blasphemies, provided not a finger is raised against the primacy of the apostolic see and the authority of Holy Mother Church." So, I mean, as the accusations come against the, the Protestants, I mean, there are legitimate, legitimate hypocrisies that are oh, yeah. apparent in uh, the Roman Catholic uh, hierarchy of, of yep. priests and such. Yeah, and I think it's beautiful how in God's providence we saw that even acknowledged in history, right? Because then the Council of Trent was basically like, hey— all right, all right, all right. Let's uh, let's kind of address <laughs> down, some of boys, these calm things. Calm down. But, uh, okay, we're uh, only fooling. <laughs> and and I don't want I don't want anyone to think that we're just like ah, we're going to be those Protestants that are going to fire all these arrows at Roman Catholics. We we could if we got in a bar fight. But the point is is like actually, you come to find the more you listen to us, we have a lot of respect for Roman Catholics. We there's a lot that I love about a lot of their beliefs and traditions. However, like one, I hope. The, these even just these intro points would start if you're Roman Catholic would persuade you to start investigating or thinking otherwise. But right, uh, right. but uh, also again, you Protestants, whether it's dealing with Roman Catholics or other um, other faiths, even uh, or atheists, agnostics, which still qualifies as other faiths, but uh, that these things would equip you with a better understanding, not just of what the word says, but what the word intends to do in right. the person and 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 in society. And so and so. Um, we are going to get into seven arguments yep. against um, Protestant, Protestantism that um, John Calvin addresses. That he counters, and, yeah. And he starts off with this, uh, this paragraph where he says, Nevertheless, they cease not to assail our doctrine and to accuse and defame it in what terms they may. And, and so the reason I'm, I'm reading this and I'm kind of passionate about it is because there are not really no new arguments that the Roman Catholic Church has to bring against Protestantism. And I think one of the, the methods that uh, is effective is that if you keep railing these arguments against people who are ignorant of the scriptures and ignorant of the hi of history, then you're gonna get somebody to crumble eventually. Yeah, that's true. And so John Calvin like wastes no time; he misses no words, and he just says, um, "Nevertheless, they see, cease not to assail our doctrine and to accuse and defame it in what terms they may, in order to render it either hated or suspected." They call it new and of recent birth. They carp at it as doubtful and uncertain. They bid us tell by what miracles it has been confirmed. They ask if it be fair to receive it against the consent of so many holy fathers and the most ancient custom. They urge us to confess either that it is schismatical in giving battle to the church or that the church must have been without life during the many centuries in which nothing of the kind was heard. Lastly, they say there is little need of argument for its quality may be known by its fruits, namely the large number of sects, the many seditious disturbances, and the great licentiousness which it has produced. Those are all 
argument yep, still, that Roman Catholics still. still say. You'll you'll hear like the what about the thirty thousand denominations? We are the one united church, and the Orthodox are over there like, no, you're not. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as if the Catholics <laughs> or the Orthodox don't have their own schisms and uh, and different sects. Uh, but no, that is actually fascinating how those particular characteristics have been maintained, like even to the present day. And, and you're going to see more of that as we get to these. Uh, seven counters, but just like, wow, like let, let that sink in. And again, like the goal of this is not to entirely just dump on the Roman Catholics, although we do agree with all that Calvin says here. We're going through this too. It's, it's going to happen. Well, but, but, but at the same time, like we should still be like in the same way that I agree with everything he's saying here to give a knife hand to, Cal, uh, to Roman Catholics and say like, Hey, no, this is what the word of God really does say. Mm -hmm. I would take that same knife hand and point at a number of my evangelical brethren who have no idea what they really believe or why right. and say, Hey, this is what the word of God really says. No, uh, let's, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's a good point. It's, time to buckle down. Let's, yep. let's get serious. I mean, Christ died for you mm -hmm. and God has given you his word. So use it yep. and use it in the way that these men like, you know, John Calvin and the Puritans and, and the, and you know, Martin Luther. Our forefathers. Like, yeah. Yeah. They, they dug in mm -hmm. and that was, that was it. Like yep. this is where they produced all this mass of, of beauty and God glorifying you know, kingdom expanding work mm. that changes the landscape of the world and makes it more Christian. Yeah. Um, but he goes on, let me finish this, this paragraph. Um, and he says, no doubt it is a, it is a very easy matter for them in presence of an ignorant incredulous multitude to insult over an undefended cause. But were an opportunity of mutual discussion afforded that acrimony which they now pour out upon us in frothy torrents with as much license as impunity would assuredly boil dry. He's basically saying, we're getting killed before we can talk about it. Yep. And if we had a chance to actually defend it and using the Bible, they wouldn't stand a chance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's over, boys. So, so then he goes into his seven points. Yeah. So I was going to say, because we, we only have so much time here, and each of these is either uh, at minimum a paragraph or like some of these that are very, very helpful are like multiple pages. Yeah. Um, so I came up with essentially a layman's trucker's version of what was Calvin saying. Uh, I would again, highly advise that you yourself, uh, I know that these are available for free in PDF form all over the internet. Yeah. You can even Wikipedia this. Yeah. Um, so we're not making nice, it up. Nice book but, like this. You know, this was actually given to me by, by my pastor. Oh, well, very nice. Yeah, That's a good awesome. pastor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say this, Amazon. But anyway, not the point. Yeah. Uh, the, well, <laughs> <laughs> the uh so so there's in other words there's gonna one be, for localism over here yeah that's right <laughs> crazy yeah that's right that's right you can drink to that you can drink to that mm. um so here's the thing is there's going to be details that we're going to gloss over or just not even get to yeah. please go see these because they're worth it but the first one is basically calvin saying hey you're saying that we're just pulling new things out of thin air when in fact none of these things are new. We're we're right. we're going back. The one of the sayings of the uh, Reformation was ad fontes, which means back to the sources. Yeah, and the source being Scripture, the original manuscripts. All right. I mean, it's like people uncover the pyramids of Giza. They're not new. They're they've just always been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, might be new to you. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it also shows you the plight of the church at large at that point. Whenever people were like, oh. <laughs> like we're talking about, we're talking about clergy who would be in seminary for close to 12 years who here comes these reformers and they're like, yeah, actually, no, this is what it says in Genesis. This is what it says in Matthew. And they're like, well, no, it doesn't. Like <laughs> they didn't tell us that. Right. right like, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's why it's helpful to have the Bible in your own language, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so here's one quote that I'll throw in from that before we move to the next point. He says that it long lay buried and unknown is the guilty consequence of man's impiety. But now when, by the kindness of God, it is restored to us, it ought to resume its antiquity just as the returning citizen resumes his rights. Now, that's someone- a, That's the second time that you've like quoted something that I- I'd Oh, yeah. Are we bonding? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> it's the it's the whiskey. Uh, <laughs> well, here's here's the the funny thing. Uh, a Roman Catholic who by no means was a Calvinist and in fact hated Calvinism uh, is actually for whatever reason beloved by Calvinists. And of course, I'm talking about G.K. Chesterton. And uh, <laughs> while he definitely didn't like Calvinism, Calvinists love him because what Calvin just said here 
Chesterton opens orthodoxy with basically this, this allegory of he himself being a man who set out to discover a great land. He does a circle in the ocean, lands on an island, thinks he's discovered this beautiful land. Turns out it's just England. He's returned <laughs> back where he always right. was. And that was his experience of coming to Christianity, this wonder and amazement to that which was also familiar. Mm -hmm. And this is the beauty of scripture. So many of us, as we demonstrated with our testimonies, we grew up in the church and yet really coming to a better understanding of scripture literally gives you new eyes, literally right. gives you a new heart. And that's what Calvin's saying here is if we would just go back to the sources, the wonders God would do with his word in the same way that when the word became flesh, the world is saved, right? right. So like, wow, like that's how powerful it is. But his second point in layman's terms was uh, wrong things. So basically, uh, <laughs> the the he's basically saying that some of the Roman Catholic um, objections are misplaced in as much as that they're they don't really know what they're shooting at. Um, so it's, he's saying it is owing to the same ignorance that they hold it be doubtful and uncertain for this is the very thing of which the Lord complains by the prophet. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not consider, but however they may sport with its uncertainty, had they to seal their own doctrine with their own blood at the expense of the life, it would be seen what value they put upon it. In other words, like they don't even really know at the end of the day, because again, they don't know the sources. These Catholic um, aggressors don't even know truly what it is that they are advocating for so, uh, so much as it relates to scripture. Right. And we so, ought not be those people. So there's no zeal behind it and mm -hmm. there's no, no real confidence in it. And it, yeah. this is the final sentence of that statement. Very different is our confidence, a confidence which is not appalled by the terrors of death and therefore not even by the judgment seat of God. Like that... Why would you be afraid of death if you're not afraid of the judgment seat of God? Because you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you because of your faith in Christ. I mean, that that is the doctrine that, that is espoused. Um, and, and so going on to, to number three, um, they demanded oh, yeah. miracles. This was so funny. Yeah. yeah. They demanded miracles. The Roman Catholics were like, okay, so what by, by what signs can this be signified? Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> he says, he says, but they have a peculiarity which we have not. They can confirm their faith by constant miracles down to the present day. No, rather, they allege miracles, which might produce wavering in minds otherwise well disposed. They are so frivolous and ridiculous, so vain and false. And he even goes on to say, like, Magicians and enchanters have always been famous for miracles, and miracles of an astonishing description yep. have given support to idolatry. Yeah. He, uh, he takes a lot of interesting avenues in this because he's, he says that, and he also says, he addresses the fact that the miracles of the apostles ceased, like that time had ended, and yet he said, but even if it didn't, like that charge is still inadequate. Well, yeah. like, that's what you were saying. So it's, he, he takes a lot... Uh, it's a big section. Yeah, so th there are two things. Like one, miracles were a sign to 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 give authority to the gospel, to the glory of God, not to mm -hmm. men. Yeah. And and second, the devil also is very good at using his power to create signs to to get people to yep. worship him. Yeah. Yeah, he has a beautiful quote towards the end where he says, "But the mark of sound doctrine given by our Savior Himself is its tendency to promote the glory not of men." but of God. And I think this is actually what you and I talked a lot about in the first episode of what ultimately won us over for Calvinism is I realized that any other soteriology or doctrine of salvation is in some way elevating man's choice or ability. But Calvinism, Calvinism is the most humblest of theologies because it says that you are literally, as Isaiah says, a worm. You, you can do nothing apart from, as Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We really believe that. Like You're, you're a dead worm. Yes, you're a dead worm. <laughs> you're not, not even a good Apart one. from Christ, you're a dead um, worm. We, I apologize, we are certainly running out of time. And there, there's, I mean, again, some of these sections are so critical and they, they're so extensive. Um, but just to quickly fly, fly through the rest of the points, um, the fourth point He's saying that, and this, this happens all the time today. He's saying, you guys say that the fathers, the early church fathers don't stand with our doctrine and our reasoning. Right. And not only does he prove that that's false, but he uses it against the Catholics because right. he's like, here's where the fathers disagree with you. Oh, he, so, he quotes the, he quotes so many church yeah, fathers who yeah. are in disagreement yeah. with, uh, with the current 
Roman Catholic yeah. doctrine. Just, and he just, even yeah. quotes a pope. And, yes, he, yeah, and, a couple actually. <laughs> so uh, I'll read this one. Uh, it says, "It is a father who testifies that the and this is the quote quote that the substance of bread and wine in the Eucharist." does not cease but remains just as the nature and substance of man remains united to the Godhead in the Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. This boundary they pass in pretending that as soon as the words of our Lord are pronounced, the substance of bread and wine ceases and is transubstantiated into body and blood. That is Pope Galatius. Yep. I would, that, I would that tell you that if you're a Protestant like Seth and I, who has been in many social media debates about this with Roman Catholics or Greek Orthodox, this is actually of the seven points. This is Calvin's largest section. Yeah. And just a cursory citation. He cites Acacius, Ambrose, Spiridon, Cassiodorus, Augustine, Epiphanius, the Council of Elvira, Ambrose, uh, Pope Galatius, as you were saying, uh, John Chrysostom, Chris, Chrysostom, yep. Another Pope Colastics, uh, and Cyprian, Apollonius, other names that I can't pronounce. <laughs> uh, and so it goes on and on and on and on. So, but ultimately, the he's funny not just thing quoting is, Augustine, which is something yeah. that we're often <laughs> accused of. Like, <laughs> you just go you back just to go Augustine. Yeah. Well, but what's funny too is the way he wraps it up is again he proves that the fathers supported Protestant ideas that the fathers contradicted Catholic ideas, but ultimately he kind of ends by saying, but it, but regardless of what they said, scripture is primary. Yeah. And that is so key. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you have one more thing you want to add on to that before we throw in the next three. <laughs> were I to show in, this is his last statement, were I to show in detail how petulantly the, those men shake off the yoke of their fathers while they wish to be thought of their most obedient sons, he says, my, my discourse would exceed its limits. He's basically saying, you know, those who are declaring that you are moving the landmarks and you are disobedient sons. Mm. They themselves are disobedient oh, sons and they've, they've moved the landmarks, but we can't really get into that anymore. Yeah, we have to move on I to mean, point we five. have a segment that we could have done on on landmarks and historic localism, but we'll have to save that for next we'll episode. we as a reel or something one day. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the next one, I'll let you summarize in layman's terms because this one I I had to I fell asleep reading this part. <laughs> I'll be honest, it was a okay. long day. So it's like it's like <coughs> so point number five. He's addressing the the argument of custom mm, like, tradition. This yeah. is the tradition passed down by the church, uh, and he says, "Were the judgments of mankind correct, custom would be regulated by the good. But it is often far otherwise in point of fact. For whatever the many are seen to do." forthwith obtains the force of custom. But human affairs have scarcely ever been so happily constituted as that the better course pleased the greater number. So he then goes on to say, the uh, the private vices of the multitude have generally resulted in public error, or rather that common consent and vice, which these worthy men ha would have to be law. Um, so he's basically saying, you know, okay, just because it's custom doesn't mean it's right. He's saying in the majority, when you look back through history, the large amount of customs, they are, they're vices. Yeah. They, yeah. Just, be, just because it's accepted by the multitude doesn't mean it's right. It's like, you know, when your teachers are like, well, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you go and jump off too? <laughs> you know, like this is, <laughs> depends what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> well, so then from there and point number six, these are actually closely related. And, and if Calvin were being honest, he probably could have put these two sections together because at point six, he's talking about like the Catholic charge that the process didn't have the institutional authority. Um, which he goes on and on to say that like there are times when human authorities or delegated human authorities from God have been wrong. And he has a tremendous section uh, where he says this, he says, why so? Because they are pastors of the church and consecrated to the Lord. And we're not Aaron and other prefects of Israel's pastors, but Aaron and his sons, though already set apart for the priesthood, erred notwithstanding when they had made the calf. Why, according to this view, should not 400 prophets who lived to Ahab represent the church? The church, however, stood on the side of Micaiah. He alone indeed and despised, but from his mouth, the truth proceeded. In other words, there were times even in scripture where the righteous were outnumbered by the other alleged righteous yeah. and where the alleged righteous erred. And that's not because uh, the insufficiency of God's power, it's because of the, inf the insufficiency of man's power. Right. Um, so anyway. Now he ahead. finishes that point with a, like a really great, a great example. Um, and he talks about the Council of Basel. 
Um, oh, the, yeah, yeah. This was a really, yeah, where this, the church is aired because that's the Catholic church. The church has never aired. The, but they yeah, have aired. the church is yeah. infallible. And so basically, like the, the Council of Basel degraded and deposed Eugenius from the popedom and substituted Amadeus in his place. Um, do their utmost, they cannot deny that the council was legitimate as far as regards external forms and was summoned not only by one pontiff, but by two. Eugenius, with the whole herd of cardinals and bishops who had joined him in plotting the dissolution of the council, was there condemned of contumacy, rebellion, and schism. Afterward, however, aided by the favor of princes, he got back his pope from safe. The election of Amadeus, duly made by the authority of a general holy synod, went to smoke. Only he himself was appeased with a cardinal's cap, like a piece of offal thrown to a barking dog. So, uh, <laughs> nice. so basically, he's saying like, yeah, the church has erred. Like you, you can't, you cannot say that there's. Yeah, I mean, it's happened. It's in history, and everyone like is looking at the thing, and like you can't deny that you're you're seeing it. Yeah, he says, so. and indeed, Hillary accounted it a very great fault in his day that men were so possessed with a foolish admiration of Episcopal dignity as not to perceive the deadly hydra lurking under that mask. His words are, and he says a Latin phrase, one advice I give, beware of Antichrist, for unhappily a love of walls has seized you. Unhappily, the church of God, which you venerate, exists in houses and buildings. Unhappily, under these you find the name of peace. Is it doubtful that in these Antichrist will have his seat? Safer to me are mountains and woods and lakes and dungeons and whirlpools, since in these prophets dwelling or immersed did prophesy. Yeah. Basically saying the visible church isn't the kingdom of God. Like and it, it solely and exclusively. Right. Yeah. Right. Now I'm not saying like if you see a church, it's not a real church. But if you just hold on to the aesthetics and the glory and the beauty of those things, which there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But if that's all you're holding on to just for like beauty's sake, you can actually be beguiled yeah. by those things yeah. and led astray, thinking that, oh, there's a church, there's a kingdom of God. Well, I see a church over there that's a PCUSA church. And yes, granted, it's Protestant, <laughs> oh, but no. you know, they're Don't teaching the liberal consumer. they're they're teaching liberal doctrine. Yeah. And and yeah. that is not, that's not glorifying God. In the same way, there were Roman Catholic churches that are not glorifying God because they are not teaching the true doctrine. They are yeah. just glossing over it. And yeah, uh, and, yeah. I mean, it spreads across, uh, particularly in this century, the century in which we live, uh, across denominational traditions. You have a number of easily identifiable apostate churches, and 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 we're going to talk much much more about kingdom theology and like what's a you know what's a real church, what's not a real church. What about yeah. the visible and invisible? Which I hate those terms. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll talk more about that. But but I, I totally agree with what you say. In as much as like we can't, um, it is not the kingdom of God is not solely and exclusively limited to one church, one governing body. <laughs> hey hey hey! I'm taking my time. All right, I'm enjoying mine. All right, so but we've really got to wrap right, up. So, and so, so the, the, so the last the, point, the last one is like a shotgun spreading of various, uh, various counters. But, but the big go through one, that and then I'll summarize all. Yeah, the big one is like, oh, there are so many sects of of Protestantism. Yeah. Like you can't be the one true Catholic Church, and and so he said it is one of the characteristics of the divine word that whenever it appears, Satan ceases to slumber and sleep. This is the surest and most unerring test for distinguishing it from false doctrines, which readily betray themselves. While they are received by all with willing ears and are welcomed by an applauding world. Basically, he's saying when there's false doctrine in the water, there is no need for Satan to do anything. Yep, it's true. His work We're is just done. seeing it right now. Yeah. But as soon as the true word is preached, boom. I mean, oh, my, the, my land, it's, it's going to be taken. Yep. Here, sure. here is the the authority and primacy of Christ. The supremacy of Christ is yeah. about to to dominate, and I, yeah. I've, got, I've got to do something. Like what was what was Satan's temptation to Jesus in the wilderness? Like yeah. all these kingdoms, I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. Yeah, and wow, that's a great point. And yeah, so, that's true. so like his grasping onto those things, mm -hmm. I mean, is is desperate, and and he is like a roaring lion. But Christ has the authority, has mm -hmm. the primacy has all supremacy and 
is all the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms yeah. of our God, our God and of his Christ. Yeah. And of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Now the whiskey's coming out. <laughs> the whiskey's coming back out. Gracious. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad that's where you, you brought that because uh, I was going to quickly like summarize or, or just go back over the points again and what the layman's explanation for him was. But on that note, um, man, like you really hit the nail on the head with respect to uh, – how do we navigate in the present day? Because again, like some of you might've been listening to this and you're like taking notes because like, oh, I can argue with Catholics now. No, 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 no. Like probably not our main point. Our main point here being like the church has a tremendous responsibility right now. I can't help but hear a quote from Pastor Jason Garwood. He posted something today. He said that apathy is the voice uh, of um, silent idolatry. Hmm. And that is so profound because like if you're a Christian today, it, it could be really tempting to say, you know what? I'm tired of all the arguing. I'm tired of all this division. I'm just going to sit back and let everything run its course, Life's whatever. World burn. But it's like, no, no, no. We're not. We're not um, uh, exaggerating. We're not. We're not putting on a performance about how wicked our days are. No, our days really are that are that wicked. We're being realistic and we're saying, God, have mercy on us, because if He were to show the full extent of His judgment, oh, mm-hmm. who who could stand? As it says in uh, Psalm 130. Right. So. What do we do with these seven objections in which are these seven counters in which uh, Calvin's saying Protestantism isn't new. It's right, been right. it's been behind the scenes for the last 2000 years. He's saying that uh, we can't misplace our our uh, roles in the church of uh, of basically acting on behalf of God and yet not knowing God. The, a great passage for this would be um, Isaiah 58, uh, in which God's people are like, hey, we're fasting and we're doing all these rituals. Why aren't these things happening? And the Lord says, because your hearts are not mine. Right. Um, I would say the second commandment. Or, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, no, not the second commandment. Uh, uh, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Oh, okay. So we're talking about the uh, third commandment. Yeah, yeah. You're just one off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Anyway, uh, so 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 again, Protestantism isn't new. Um, we need to always be centered about really who is God and how are we accountable to Him. The third point. Uh, no, yeah, Protestantism nor Roman Catholicism, nor anyone in the church at this point, sorry, Charismatics, there are no signs and wonders of the day. That's, that's, that's crazy. But not to say that there aren't miracles. The right. fact that you and I are breathing is a miracle. The fact that we get to see the Lord's Supper every week is a miracle. The fact that you're baptized in the triune name is a miracle. Healing but still we, happen. People have their needs met. and Yeah. But, it, but, it, but the fact that, you know, you know I'm going to make one leg grow longer than the other guy in a mall that no, that's not. Yeah, I can personally attest that that does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have one to make shorter than the other. <laughs> Trust me. I didn't mean to, that. Wasn't where I went. To hey, go. that's okay. I insulted your windshield. You insult my legs. <laughs> I was about to say we'll take a picture. Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, can, then, can I sum so, up all of this in like just a really brief? Yeah, I was just gonna say, and then the fathers on the side of the Protestants, and then yeah, but then uh, an institutional. Yeah, go ahead. Take away. There's only is, three more. Is points. there is assurance for for the Protestant? And oh yeah, the there, yeah, yeah. Like, thank, that's thank the you. big yeah. thing. <laughs> is that this? Any sort, if you are confused, if you're angry, if you're upset, if you just feel like, you know, this has no legs under it, um, then that's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. Yep. And the fact of the matter is that according to Holy Scripture, you have tremendous precedent Mm -hmm. under your belt. And that these doctrines that are laid down, um, that you have been taught in the pulpit of your church, they, they are found in the Bible and they are legitimate. Yep. Your faith is legitimate. The thing and that historic. you believe yeah. is legitimate. And you are not going to go to hell because you trust in the Lord God by faith. You're not. You're not going to go to hell if you don't convert to Roman Catholicism. Or Greek, or Greek Orthodox. You are not saved by Roman Catholicism. You're saved by Christ. Now, they would argue they say the same thing, but... But I'm telling you, they would also argue that they pull you're, down every you're week. pretty yeah. close to not going to heaven because you're Protestant. Yep. And and that's just not the case. And that's the argument here. And and Calvin does a great job of of arguing against those things, but there's tremendous biblical precedent as well. Yeah. Thank now, you for saving me the time because you definitely summarized that way sooner than I would have. Now, as as far as like as, if we're gonna wrap this up, here's here's the last thing that we're we're gonna we're gonna do real quick. 
I'll no, say short. No, we're not going to do it real quick. We'll <laughs> we'll open the next episode with this. Good. All right. Is, uh, so is how Calvin orders. Oh, his the, books. yeah, yeah, yeah. We should, yeah, we should yeah. wait on that. I, I was the last thing I was going to say is again just a plug too for Christian civilization is again remember the framing of this. Calvin understood that while of course he was to tend to his flock in this growing fledgling Protestant movement, right with with the masses. Who did he go to though? He wasn't just reaffirming them and their beliefs. He went to the highest in the land to instruct the civil master of this is what God puts on your lap. What are you going to do with it? Um, and we have to remember that because particularly in a day where we have all these quote unquote revivals, if we're really going to see a great movement of God, how we will know that we have been blessed with a true reformation is when the elites that we always complain about that, that, that they too hear the gospel and are transformed by it. That's the thing. We can complain all we want and have you know, legitimate conspiracy theories all I want because those are becoming more and more true these days. But at the end of the day, until they too hear the gospel and are told that they are submitted to King Jesus, until that happens, we can have all these, uh, you know, passion conference type experiences all we want and they're probably not legit. But real reformation will be granted to us when the church is renewed in now, her worship. People will be saved. Yeah, no, of but, course, there'll still be good that comes out of it, but you're not going to see this land be given over back to Christ until... Uh, the church is renewed in her worship, and that is acknowledged by the civil society. And so, I'm gonna I'm gonna land this plane in Ephesians chapter two, where uh, Martin Luther he he found this phrase in Habakkuk, which I couldn't find in Habakkuk because I couldn't remember the the reference. But it's Ephesians two eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God. So mm -hmm. as we study these doctrines of uh, the Christian institutes, by grace you have been saved, and we're going to see how that gets worked out. Absolutely. So, um, guys, I hope that you have found something of great merit in this, and I hope you don't hold it to your account, but you only trust on the merit of Jesus Christ and his mm -hmm. work on the cross on your behalf. Yeah, and I'm sorry that I didn't finish my glass because, I mean, if I do, then I'm going to be up for, or maybe it would knock me out. Maybe I do need to finish it. But as we close, we do, I think we've decided on a new closing phrase. So, Seth, how goes the world? The world goes not well, but the, but kingdom, the kingdom comes. comes. You're empty, but I'll, you know, whatever. <laughs>